I'm really interested in the fact that it's uh, a growing term. It's defining an increasing number of people as more and more people are moving from their indigenous roots. And also as we start to collectively connect with each other as we're able to now because of the information age that we're in and because of technology and because of social media, because of our ability to connect with our tribes wherever they may be in the world. We're part of a diaspora because we've been displaced predominantly for South Asians through partition. There is often a story of um, loss or warfare or um, tragedy around being part of a diaspora, right, or being children of a diaspora. What if we were to own it and it wasn't something that was negative or loaded in a negative way? What if we were to actually own it and create something with it, something that's powerful and empowering, and we were to look at what are the different facets that make us unique because we're of the diaspora and how do we use those? So we've actually been raised in this time capsule in a kind of fancy land that's romanticised, that's childlike, that is actually really beautiful, but isn't really real. So how fascinating, what an amazing place to connect on. Because when we leave our homes, we're often not in that fancy land anymore. We're somewhere that's very different that we have to assimilate to in order to survive that we have to minimise ourselves in, that we have to censor ourselves in. And so how do we sort of manage that duality? How do we reconcile those aspects? Which is also just part of being intersectional, right? Yeah. So there's something really interesting about being part of a diaspora and, and a sort of compassion, I think, that people have when they operate at different intersections. I'm going to stereotype here a little bit, right? So if we look at the Asian man traditionally being raised in a space which is they're doted on by their mothers, by their sisters. They're raised to believe that they are the most important, the most powerful beings. So when we look at the diaspora, that sense of um, entitlement becomes eroded because those men are not in their place of origin. They're in a foreign land and so when they go out into the world, they're not the primary they're encountering racism, and so they're being minimised. Like, what does that do? Well, at its best, what it does is create a level of understanding and compassion for other people that are also marginalised in different ways. Do you know what I mean? So I think there's so much power in being part of this diaspora. There's this saying that the Indians in the UK are more Indian than the Indians. You don't have um, generational wealth. You don't have generational power. Um, you may be quite young, you may not have your parents, your grandparents with you. In that sort of situation, you will create a fantasy land because you're trying to create a home in a new place. I mean, I grew up being told, you know, we're different, you know. So I was in Southall till I was six and then we moved to Winchester and we were the first Asian family to move there. And so there was, you know, this, I was surrounded by difference and what I thought was foreign actually you know like the first day I got my school lunch like I would never eat my school dinners because I didn't know what any of it was I didn't understand it I didn't like the way it smelled I didn't like the way it looked like I'd been eating like proper desi home food right my mum's cooking there's there's a foreignness right so we're seen as foreign but I was looking at them as foreign like yeah. what is this foreign food and what are these foreign customs and stuff and at home I was being told we're different you know we have different customs and social norms and um, practices and faiths and language and everything, right? There's something in us being raised in this fantasy land, in this time capsule, not questioning it, understanding that as being Punjabi or being Indian or being whatever, having these sort of family holidays to Punjab, hanging out with cousins and stuff there, but feeling foreign there as well, right? So being like, oh, I'm not the same and my Punjabi isn't good enough and so I found myself last year really questioning where home was. I got to this place where I was like, I don't feel like I have a home. Particularly since this whole Brexit fiasco, um, I felt very um, detached from the British aspect of my identity. And although I've really feared traveling to India on my own as a queer presenting woman, I just felt like it was something that I had to do. And so I connected with um, other LGBT activists in Bombay uh, in the run-up to Pride. And they just welcomed me in and introduced me to their families and friends. And 
I started to build a community and network out there. So when, when the things that we're marginalised for become our power, yeah. right, and our strength, how beautiful is that? Bombay felt like home at that time, and these friends felt like home because they were other queer Asian women. And I wasn't really meeting any other queer Asian women um, because there aren't that many queer Asian women that are out in the UK. And as someone that hasn't had my family, because I was disowned when I came out as gay almost 14 years ago, I haven't had that aspect of home. So that was lost for me. The aspect of home, family, culture, language, customs, um, celebrations, food, you know, all of this stuff that we take for granted that is from our little fantasy world suddenly wasn't there anymore. And so for me, going to India and exploring my motherland um, and that aspect of home for myself was really important. So the queer community feels like home. Speaking to other queer South Asian people feels like home. Going to the dry cleaners and speaking in Punjabi uh, feels like home. And I started to realise that actually I have many homes. Like, how lucky am I? I think my, my relationship with what home is has really shifted the more I've travelled. And it's become less about the labels and identity of being British or Indian or Punjabi or any of these things. It's become about all of those different facets of identity and, and how different places draw those out of me in different ways. So I think home, yeah, for me home is, is many different things, but I think it's, it's not necessarily a place. I know someone's making a subji with alu in it, like it has a very particular smell, right? And that feels like home and I can be anywhere in the world. I think that all great movements are born out of struggle. For, for me personally, my experience as a child growing up under Thatcher and seeing uh, the race movement and race riots, you know, and we're seeing this now digitally with Black Lives Matter, we're seeing this with Me Too, you know, we're seeing the digitized version of um, protest essentially in many ways that we are stronger as communities of colour now than we've ever been. As children of diaspora, as queer people, as women, as any of these marginalised senses of self, right, is so damaging for us. It's so exhausting on our mental health. And I think as soon as we liberate ourselves from that, things start to change. So looking at the queer community now and looking at the spaces that exist, the platforms that exist, the parties, the meetups uh, that exist for queer people of colour now is amazing. You know, I can walk into a space and I can see people like me who are queer and fabulous and expressing themselves and celebrating themselves. And that's about a particular time. And again, that is also about sort of the digitization of certain movements and tribalism and us being able to connect. Yeah, it's a really amazing time right now to be a person of colour, to be from own communities, to be queer, to be any number of different intersections that previously we were marginalised about because now we can find people like ourselves and we can unite and we can come together, whether that is in digital spaces or real life spaces, whether that's in your local community, whether that's a global aspect of that. For me to be able to have one conversation with women and then another conversation with my queer friends, another conversation with people of colour and to be able to cross-pollinate those ideas and actually develop new ideas or share some of that thinking with each of those different groups, that's for me really interesting. And again, I think that is one of the most powerful things about being part of the diaspora. Being unheard, being invisible, being censored all the fucking time is really, really exhausting. But, and that, for me, you know, it was, it was really, really hard. But as soon as I took myself out of that and I started freelancing and I started making more time for my art and my activism, and I stopped having to be one person here and another person there, as soon as I started to bring all of those things together, that's when I started to not only feel really healed in myself, but also have a lot more clarity of thought and see that my thinking and my ideas were developing. And that's really what we should all be doing. I think giving yourself permission to, to be exactly who you are. And that is a real privilege. Giving myself permission to access all the rich 
beautiful spiritual wealth that is part of my culture um, has for me led to giving myself permission to do so many other things in terms of who I am, you know. As an artist, I'm a musician, I'm a singer, giving myself permission to, to do that because my art is also my activism. Are we just cutting out homosexuality like a cancer and disowning people and not talking about it so that our children grow up feeling like it doesn't exist? It doesn't exist anywhere, there's no one like me. You know, there's no one like me in my family, there's no one like me on TV, there's no one like me when I walk down the street. So that means that I can't own this part of who I am. Yeah, so like, so that part, I'm going to suppress that part of myself or it's going to come out in toxicity, it's going to come out in addiction, it's going to come out in self-harm, it's going to come out in mental health issues, whatever it is, it's going to come out somehow. You know, I remember seeing my brother a couple of years ago and he was like, you're free. And I was like, I don't, what are you talking about? Because I was in a place of victimhood. I was like, I've been disowned, I've been rejected, I'm hurt, I feel lost, actually. I was depressed, you know, for a long time. And he was like, you're free. And that just flipped my brain. I was like, yeah, I'm free. Wow, what an amazing way of looking at it. Because I don't have to conform. I don't have to adhere to any way of being other than whatever I determine that to be. That's freedom. And when I went to India this winter, I was like, I really felt it. I was like, I can go anywhere, I can do anything, I can be exactly who I am. That's freedom. Like, what an amazing place to be. But it came from a place of complete loss. It came from a place of the thing that I feared the most in my life, which was being disowned. Yeah. To be in this place now, I would not be in this place if it was not for that. I spent so much of my life fighting and things not making sense. Nothing made sense. Now, everything makes sense. It's the only way I know how to describe it, really. I can really understand why the things that have happened in my life have happened. Um, the good and the bad, you know? Um, because they've all led me to be here. And I feel like... I wish I'd been more patient with myself, do you know what I mean? Like, if I could say something to my younger self, it's like, it's cool, like, it's gonna be fine, right? And um, to be in that place of, yeah, it's cool, is, is amazing because it's freedom and that comes from vulnerability, you know. It's really liberating vulnerability and just being who you are, you know.